Okay guys, so today I'm doing a deck doctor style video. Most of the content I do is either based on recommendations in the comments or just stuff I'm interested in, which has mostly been White Forest and now Azamina and some Centurion stuff. But I will be covering Rage of the Abyss meta and also crossover breakers. I know there are people that are interested in Ryzeal and Malice, and I'm interested in both of those. So if you're interested in any of this stuff, uh, feel free to subscribe. And if you don't want to, then don't subscribe. Um, so I have 11 submissions here. I probably will spend a little bit more time on the first one just because I wanted to show that everyone should be using a probability calculator when you build your deck. And if you're not in the habit of this, and I think most people aren't, I hope that I can show you some of the value of losing, of, of using it. And if you have any suggestions or ideas or disagreements, then let me know in the comments if you think I got anything wrong. Okay, so... Uh, first things that we notice, this is a White Forest Azamina deck that is playing a single engraver in the main for the uh, four card extra deck package, so the closed heaven line going into Wave Viking Caesar. Um, first of all, I think that this is best in a scenario where you don't have space for more Fiendsmith cards, because those cards are just broken, but you can easily put two bodies on field for the closed heaven and do that line. Now, if you watch my Azamina Tips and Tricks video, you'll know that the Wanted engine or the Azamina engine, so basically Wanted or Witch or uh, Deception, uh, these naturally put two bodies on field with the Witch and the Murcielago, if, if you're doing the, the full combo. And so these naturally lend really, really well into the Closed Heaven line because you already have those two bodies. If you're not playing that, I feel like Rabbit is the best alternative that I've found. Um, although I think that maining the, the targets for it is bad because when you go second, these cards are bricks. But um, in this deck profile, I think that this is a solid option because you're obviously struggling for space if you're at 44. And it makes sense that you would be going for Closed Heaven pretty, pretty regularly. Now, in terms of the other supporting engine, we have the Azamina engine. And I am not sure why you wouldn't play the full engine, because you have three Wanted, three Deception, but one Witch. So uh, here's an example of where we can use the probability calculator. So you have 44 cards in your main deck, and you have um, seven Azamina starters, because you have the, the three Seeker, the three Deception, the one Witch. That's seven cards, okay? So if you're going first, you have five cards in hand. And you will see at least one of these cards, one of these starters, 60% of the time. And if you were going second, then it would be about 67% of the time. Now, if you were playing um, the full one, so you had two more witch in here, then that seven would go to a nine. And the chance of seeing at least one of those starters goes up by about 10%. 10%, I think, is a substantial enough amount to where I don't know why you wouldn't play more of it. And... Usually the reason that you would play less, so obviously Wanted is a better card than Witch, so if you had to choose between Wanted and Witch, you would obviously play the lowest number of Witch and the highest number of Wanted. Um, but usually if you were doing this, it would be because you need so much space for the other stuff in your deck, whether it's non-engine or engine. But here we see that you have two Tails, which is like easily one of the more cuttable cards in a typical White Forest deck. Maybe not all of them, but in most of them. So like, let's say that we were staying at 44. There's no reason, I think, that you should have two tails and one witch. It should then be like one tail and two witch. Or you could even argue for cutting all tails because you still have a target off of the Sylvie and, um, and three witch. Or what happens with a lot of white forest deck profiles is they will cut down on the less necessary cards, like put a Sylvie to one and Rusia to one and max out on the other stuff. Um... If you were only playing one Sylvie, the chance of you drawing it is low enough that you normally would be getting the search off of the, like the search for the woes or the tails off of a Sylvie that you searched in your combo or off of an Arciella. And so I feel like there is an argument for playing one tails and and uh, and one woes or zero tails and, and one woes. But I do think that if, if we go into a bestial format, it would be quite risky to only play one of each of the tuners. So another thing is that the toy cards are... Well, they're, they're obviously good with the White Forest stuff, but they're even better with the Wanted engine because the chance of you drawing like toy cards and nothing to set them off is way lower when you were playing both White Forest and the Wanted stuff. You know, like if you open, um, if you open Witch and Box, for example, you box set the tank and the soldier. The witch sends the soldier, which triggers the soldier. The soldier comes back, and because you have the tank, you can search a level four light. And then even if you're on only a single Sylvie, you bridge into your entire White Forest engine. So I think that, like, even though there are decks that would just throw in a Fiendsmith package just because the cards are broken, and that'll honestly probably be an improvement to most decks, if you have bridges between your engines, you should be playing those bridges. Like, one of the reasons that... Um, 
the Snake Eyes archetype is probably the best with the Azamina stuff is because their entire wanted engine can choose between the uh, Deception Search, like basically the Azamina branch, or the original Sinful Spoils. Um, and then there's also... Uh, this card is, is way worse, obviously, but it's like another option. So the more options you have without hamstringing your own deck, I feel like the better it is. So yeah, I see no reason to not play the full uh, wanted package here. Okay, let me not spend too long on this. Uh, the other thing is that you're mixing breakers with hand traps, but I think this is this is not as problematic as people who do like Ash Veiler Droplet. If you have Droplet with low impact hand traps that you have to discard to use, then you start your turn having used the Ash and the Veiler, for example, and less cards in hand to send off of Droplet. And also you're on a car on a deck that has to have multiple cards in hand just to play uninterrupted. Um, and then you don't, you're not supposed to make up these idealistic scenarios in your head where you're like, oh, but what if I drew like the soldier and my, and I set it and then I drop it or I activate box so my opponent allows me to resolve it. And then I drop it. Like, forget about that. You just look at what is going to be in your hand, like in a typical hand and, um, you deck build around that. So, but I think that this deck, like in terms of the game plan looks pretty good, but I think the, the ratios are, are probably not efficient, uh, mostly because of the, the lack of witch and maybe too many, uh, tails here. Okay. So let's go on to the next one. So he says, ignore the side. Uh, so here we have a slightly larger Fiendsmith engine with one tract and a Lurry and two engraver. Oh, there's also the, the Lacrima here. And uh, wait, this layout is confusing me a little bit. But so there's two soldiers and three boxes. There are two tails. So I, so, okay, first of all, I think that if you're at 45 cards, this is not acceptable. Um, Generally speaking, the math doesn't change very much if you are on. Actually, let me just let me just show you this. So, uh, let's this, this is laid out a little bit more cleanly. So let me use this as an example. Okay, um, in terms of your primary engine, so let's say this is White Forest Toy. You have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen cards. That's just for the sake of example. Let's only talk about these seventeen cards right now. If you your deck size is forty four. So let's just say your, your main engine has uh, 17 cards in it, okay? You can be assured that in almost every single game, you're going to see one of those cards. But this is a two-card combo deck. And so the bare minimum is that you need to see at least two of these cards. Um, now, yes, you can say, well, if you drew Imperm, you could send the Imperm off of the LZ or whatever. Uh, I mean, and that's like really not optimal at all. The cards that you want to draw together, not the bare minimum just to be able to play, is what you want to build your deck around. So if only 65% of the time you're going to see a combination of your primary engine, then that's a little bit worrisome. Now, in this particular deck, you also have an entire other sub-engine, which is all of these cards. Um, it doesn't like plug in as cleanly because obviously the White Forest and the toy cards interact a little bit differently to these cards. But um, let's add these in. So if you go from 17 uh, to 20, 23, 24, if we were going up to like 24 cards, it's almost every single game that you're gonna see at least two of these cards. So now you're feeling a little bit better. Um, and if you were going second, it's, uh, it's close to 93%. Um, and then there will also be a majority of games where you're gonna see three of those cards. And in which case, the other cards will probably be your non-engine cards. Um, but when you're looking at these types of ratios, right? Let's say that we were bumping up to, to 45. And let's say we go back down to the regular engine. Um, you have a 63% chance of seeing what I would consider the bare minimum. If you go down to uh, 40, that goes up to 72. It's almost a 10% jump. So I think that if you're playing multi-card combo decks, you realistically should be playing 40 cards. Um, that said... Going from 40 to 41 or 42 doesn't change the math that much. I think once you start going to 43 and 44, it is it does actually matter and you shouldn't be doing that. So 45 is not acceptable. Um, th these are like also like examples of why one engraver in the main and no other Fiendsmith cards in the main can work if you can provide those two bodies for closed heaven. Because then you could just say, okay, you're at 45 right now. If you take out one engraver, you're at 44. You still have one. You take out Lacrima, you're at 43. Uh, you take out Lurie, you're at 42. You take out Tract, you're at 41. Now you're almost at 40. Now it's like, okay, maybe that's fine. You know, there's not really much of a difference between 40 and 41. Um, and you're still making closed heaven plays. So, uh, yeah. And then another thing to consider is like, 
Lacrima does contribute to your normal summon count. So if you have, uh, let's let, let's actually count this real quick. So there's two Sylvie. Let's ignore the soldier for a moment. Two Sylvie, one Lacrima, uh, two Estellar, and uh, the Lurie is also a normal, like contributes to the normal summon count. Because just because you want to search it doesn't mean you're not going to draw it. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think uh, I think this would this deck would probably be better with just one engraver in the main, or you're going to have to consider using your non-engine differently. This is, let's see, where's the, so you're also playing one witch, but you're at 45, so you're you're struggling for space, um, and you want to play hand trap. So I think that's like fair if you want to play more hand trap. So it's Fulos, Ash, Ogre, Valor, and Imperm. So wait, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Hmm. And I also think that you're not on enough hand traps. If you're playing only low impact hand traps, you should be playing more of those because the, the full loss um, may draw you hand traps. It also may draw you engine. I guess if you count the full loss, 3, 6, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, this is really like borderline, borderline. I feel like uh, you should probably just go down to one engraver though. Um, yeah, that would be my my main advice there. The the rest of it looks kind of uh, standard, I would say. Like I think the Centurion Legatia is uh, is a fine card. You you sometimes want to make a twelve, and uh, the rest of it is uh, is okay. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. I think I'm taking too long on each of these. Um, so we have a couple bestials. We have a pretty large Fiend with engine, although there's only one tract, and uh, <laughs> why do why, why do people uh, lay out their their engines in like s separate places. Like there's an ash in the middle of the Rusi and the Estellar. That's so bizarre. Um, okay, so we are at forty, and uh, let's first see how many hand traps are in here. So there's two nib. There's there's two bestials. So we're at four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then there's a talents. There's two talents. There's so we're at fourteen if we count the talents. Um, so I think that if you were, uh, again, again, these are not like, uh, problems to mix per se, like the talents with your low impact non-engine, but, um, there are certain non-engine cards that are not as frequently usable as others. So if you are playing against people that bestials aren't good against, these cards might not be helpful. If you're playing against people that talents isn't good against, those cards might not be helpful. I feel like generally speaking, going into the next meta, the talents is probably going to be good, um, and the bestials are probably going to be good. So I guess like I don't really have too much to complain about that. Although I would say that um, I think that, that maining cards like reframing is generally a bad idea. And those cards should be in your side. Because these just going second are really just bricks. Um, I'll get to this in. I think there's there's a, there's another profile that has like a bunch of cards that are really bad to draw. But I think overall the idea of this deck is fine. I don't think that there's anything like very obviously wrong with the ratios. There is... Um, the toy engine is basically as large as you could want besides reinforcement to the army, but you're at 40. Um, I would definitely play a reinforcement to the army over reframing, I think, or some other type of engine card. Um, the only thing that is risky about this is if you don't draw the toy engine, then you don't really have uh, spells or traps that you want to discard off of the LZ or the Estella or the Rusia. Like, you don't want to get rid of an Imperm. You don't want to get rid of a, of a Talents or a Call By. Um, so this is the, this is the main downside of this type of build. Um, yeah, that, I'd say that's, that's probably, but everything else looks kind of standard, I would say. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Um, so this one has a large, wait a second. So there's two deceptions in here, three wanted and three witch. Uh, okay, so if you are going to buy these cards in real life, as far as I know, deception is the only card that is secret. And um, I think that there is actually a big difference between having one deception and having two, not because of the chance of drawing them, but because when I do the standard combo, I go through two deception every single combo. And then you like recycle them and you uh, it's part of your resource loop. Um, so if you're considering what like what to buy, I think that two deception is definitely better than one. And then the difference between two and three deception, especially, especially if you're considering the ratios of like three wanted, three witch, and then two versus three. So you're looking at like um, eight cards versus nine is super minimal. Um, so just like, I guess, consider that. Um, okay. 
We also have Droplet in here, which means that we need to seriously evaluate the rest of the non-engine to, to know whether or not this is appropriate. But I think that we only have... Just to make sure I'm not missing anything, it's only Droplet and Evenly Match. So Evenly Match is not the worst card to, pay, to, to, to pair with Droplet because you could like... If you draw both, <clears throat> if you draw both of them, you could go battle phase. You activate evenly matched. If they do something like uh, chain Desiree, you can chain the drop plate and send the evenly matched. Um, so I think that's fine. But I think that I think that uh, six is just not enough. Six six non engine cards is simply not enough in a deck that isn't the best at playing through interruptions. Because like for example, if you draw um, a stellar and uh, soldier. Your ability to play through interruptions is like two or three times better than if you drew a stellar and like a evenly matched, where you send the evenly matched, your opponent sees you send that for cost, and they're like, okay, bro, your hand is trash. And then they veil the stellar, and then you you're, you just pass turn, and, you're, and it's horrible. But if you send the, the soldier, you like, you don't even care if they imperm or veil your stellar, because the soldier's coming back, and that's going to search you something else, and you're going to continue playing, especially if you started with box. Um... So I feel like there's there's too much variance in this deck's ability to play through interruptions to where you actually do need to play more non-engine than this. If you are only on breakers, you do not need to play that many, but I think like 10 to 12 is the sweet spot. Um, now the, the rice map, okay? So this card, I, people were testing this before. Here's the problem with this card. At the start of your main phase, so this has to be the first action you take in your main phase. You cannot do this at any other point in your main phase. You add one monster with zero attack from your deck to your hand, but have your life points. After adding it to your hand, until the end of the next turn after this card was activated, you cannot activate the added monster's effects or the effects of cards with its name until you normal summon that monster or card with its name. So what's weird about this, right, is it's not even like if you add the monster and then you don't summon it, you can still like woes and bring it out on their turn. And then, you know, like if it was an LZ or an Estellar, you might be able to trigger it in the grave or whatever. Um, you just can't use its effects, period, until the end of the next turn. And the other thing is that um, LZ is not a normal summon card. Like you will, you, you never want to normal summon this unless you're in some like extremely strange scenario. So the only target is the Estellar. And um, I don't think that you should be playing three map when there's only one target in the entire deck that is also a three of that is also searchable. So um, if you did want to play the map because you felt like a stellar was a really important card, I think that it would be a better ratio if you played like one map and three a stellar. Actually, let me just bring up the probability calculator again. So let's say you're on a 40 card deck um, and you're looking at a stellar here and you have three a stellar. Oops. So the chance of you drawing at least one is a third of the time. Now, if you also add in the map, so let's say we're going up to six a stellar, because that's basically what it is, you go up to 57% um, of the time. So obviously it's nicer to draw your starter uh, more of the time. Um, if you were at four, okay, so let's say like a stellar and just one single um, map, the chance of you drawing combinations of those cards would be very low. More specifically, the chance of you drawing a stellar if you're playing three and map if you're playing one is less than 4% of the time. If you are on three map, it goes up to close to 9% of the time. So for reference, this 9% of the time is almost the level of drawing driver. If you if you played Yu-Gi-Oh! when uh, Gamma was at three and you would draw driver, which was the target for Gamma. Um, so if you have played Gamma Driver, you know that that's actually pretty annoying. So I, I feel like dropping from the 9% to um, the less than 4% when you only have one good target for it anyhow is uh, worth it. Like, th there's you don't really need this. And the other two maps should be other breakers like uh, Dark Ruler or Raigeki or Thrust or whatever, or you just take out all three of them. Um, also, it's worth thinking that you have three Sylvie in your build. So the number of normal summons in your deck is, um, oops, it's six if you're just counting the Sylvies and the Estellars. And um, Jesse Cotton popularized this number of five normal summons where um, as you increase above five, the chance of you drawing 
more than one normal summon increases more than the chance of you drawing just one normal summon. Now, I don't think that that math is actually like a very good number to focus on because there are some decks that will just lose if they don't have their normal summon. Like if you used to play Invoked back in the day, if you don't see um, Alistair, your hand is trash, bro. It doesn't matter what's in your hand, your hand is trash. So you needed to see that card. So there are some decks where you actually just need to see a card. But um, if you go from, you know, six normal summons to map would be nine. Um, so uh, it's actually going to be pretty frequent that you're going to draw multiple normals if you include the map, you know. So it's almost a fifth of the time. So yeah, and then the last thing that I would say about this profile... Wait, I didn't even look at the... Wait, what is this card? Actually, I don't know what this card is. Someone tell me. Um, yeah, anyhow, the other thing I was going to say is that you're maining, reframing, and Azurun. I think that maining one of them is already not good because the actual best decks don't have to do that. But like, okay, you know, like if you're going to... Especially if you don't have the Fiend Swift stuff, so it's not like you're using the... As a mean aligned to make a closed heaven, like I understand that you probably need to main the rabbit because it's so much more value than other stuff, and you want to play the, the silhouette trick or the Azurune. But um, both this and the reframing, I feel like, is major overkill. If you really want to play this card, I feel like just put it in the side deck. To be honest, um, yeah, we see also go to the deep beyond. I think this is better if you're playing full loss because it, it, it can clear your board in scenarios where you've already you know put out a couple interruptions and then you're using go to the deep beyond. Um, so I don't think it's as good in, in this version, uh, two chaos angel. Um, I, I don't, I don't dislike it. I, uh, I, I think the extra deck is, is wait, why is there only one target when you have such a big Azamina engine? I just realized, um, I feel like you should, you have to play Murcielago, actually. I don't know why I didn't notice this. You have to play Murcielago. The, the combo becomes so much better. If you check for interruptions and you see that they're not interrupting you and you can go for the full combo, like, that's crazy. That is, it's like, at a bare minimum, it is the Omni Negate and a Rabbit for free without using any of your other cards. So even if you're not playing the Fiends with stuff. So you have to play Murcielago. Um, I, I like Sol, but you don't have to play Sol. I would say that card can be optional. And I'm going to talk about the Power Sync uh, in another profile so okay this one is crazy um first of all summoner monk uh so summoner monk maybe a lot of you have never even seen this card because this card is from 17 billion years ago so this is a dark level four this is a normal summon um if this card is normal or flip summon change this card to defense position so this is a mandatory trigger once per turn, you can discard a spell, so that's cost. Special summon a level 4 monster from your deck, but that monster cannot attack this turn. So um, this can bring out Sylvie, most importantly. I guess it could also bring out Soldier, and it could also bring out Rusia, but um, uh, this guy's also playing um, Quem and Cartesia, so um, there, there are you know multiple options for targets for this card. Um, I think that if you have three Estellar and... Wait, is there and one Sylvie and three Soldier? You have a lot of normal summons already. So I think the Monk is too many normal summons. But that's not the main issue that I have with the deck. The main issue with the deck is that the deck is trying to do too many things. So like there's a difference between... Um, which one? Just to make sure I don't lose it. So that was this one. The, the difference between like this deck, I think the game plan makes sense. Um, it, it's... The, the, the cards that are in here make sense, but the ratios maybe need some improvement. But um, here, it's like the game plan is so all over the place. So the um, Shadow's Light. So Shadow's Light. Um, target a dark monster you control. Uh, that's the, the activation procedure. Special a light monster from your deck or extract with the same original type and level. Um, so this is an example of a win more card. And what a win more card means is that it doesn't do something by itself. You have to already be able to play. So you have to have the target for it. And then you can special summon the monster from your deck or extra deck with the same original type and level. Um, the uh, duality is similar. So I'm not saying these cards are bad, okay? Tribute a light or dark monster. So that's the cost. Um, so this means that you you have to already be able to play. You have to have the lighter dark monster. Then you special summon a lighter dark monster from your hand or extra deck with the same original type and level, but a different original attribute. So if you tribute a light, you have to summon a dark. If you tribute a dark, you have to summon a light. And 
Like there have been decks that have uh, used this kind of in like a gimmicky way to bring out Dragoon and stuff like that. And I feel like that's probably a better example of how to use it because um, Dragoon in some formats was almost a win condition against certain decks. Like certain decks either didn't have the out or they did have it, but they had to hard draw it. And so they would just lose to a Dragoon. But I feel like if you're adding in a bunch of cards where you already need something else to be able to play and you don't have a win condition, then I don't think it's worth it. But also you're playing like, um, you're playing, uh, what's this card called? The Beware the White Forest, which is the like the worst one. Um, and also you're playing Scourge, um, which is, uh, I think fine, but I, th I think this is like a side deck card. Um, and then you're also playing like the Fiendsmith Sanct, which is like also one of the worst of those cards. And then you're you're playing, uh, like there's so many search targets. There's so many things that like you want to search and not draw, but because there's so many of them, you are in most games or, you know, almost most games going to draw at least one of these cards that you want to search and not draw. Um, so it's like the reframing, the, I forget what this one is called. Um... Also, woes you could count to, to this ratio, the, the Scourge, the Beware. Yeah, there's just like, there's too much going on here. I think you need to simplify the game plan. Uh, okay, so just a couple more left. Let's see what time I'm, I'm at. Oh my lord. Okay, I'm going to try to go more quickly. So, okay, Centurion. Centurion is an archetype that I love and I also think is trash. Um, Bestial Centurion is something that I've theory crafted quite a lot. And... Um, Let's see how this guy has built it. So there's the Gargoyle, which I think you have to play. There's the Atri, which is trash, but you have to play. These cards are trash. Gargoyle and, and Atri are trash, but you have to play them. So these are like engine requirements. Um, what's this card called again? Uh, the uh, Wake Up is trash, but you also have to play it in pure. And uh, Phalanx is not trash, but you don't want it. You don't want to draw it if you're going second. And you even if you were going first, you'd rather have searched it than drawn it. So just when you were starting looking at Centurion, you have um, Gargoyle, Atri is two cards. Um, Wake Up and Phalanx is four cards. Um, so let's bring this up again. Um, so we don't want to draw. Um, these cards... Almost half of your games, you're going to draw a card that you don't want to draw. You would rather search it. It's not that it's unusable. It's just that it's clearly worse or lower quality than other cards. Like Emblema is an insane card. Emblema is an extremely broken card. It is one of those flexible cards that any archetype has ever had, and it's a quick play. Um, the stand-up is also an insane card, although you do lose, you do have to send a card to get another card. Um, so like the quality of cards is so all over the place in this archetype and you just have to accept that there are trash cards in this deck. Um, and so when you're deck building, there's a huge amount of pressure not to add in even more suboptimal cards. So like, um, bonds, I would say is probably the least bad of all of the bad cards, but it's still a card that requires some type of, um, setup because you're placing from your hand or grave. It's not like you're placing from your deck. Um, now, let's see. Let's let's look at the non-engine ratios because this matters a lot. So there's 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So if you're counting the bestials, it's 17. 3, 6, 9, 10, 11, 12, or 12 if you're not counting the bestials. Uh, 41 cards. I think these ratios, ratios are actually really clean. Um... Although I'm not sure about Bonfire because you Bonfire is uh, is Trudea and you have quite a lot of normal summons now because uh, you have like six, seven here, eight, nine normal summons here. I feel like that's uh, really pushing it for normal summons. Uh, I think if I was playing Bonfire, maybe I would just play a single Bonfire. Um, you'll never draw more than one and you'll only draw it with the search target Trudea a very small percentage of the time. And that would also put you at a clean 40. The um, Regained is really good in this deck. I really like that uh, card. Um, Lubelion feels a lot better when you're going first. When you're going second, you know, it, it's not, you can't turn it into a Bestial yet to interrupt your opponent. So it doesn't feel as good. Anyhow, let's look at the, I, I think that this, the game plan makes sense. The ratios I think are actually pretty good. Um, but the deck is mostly held back by its inherent limitations, which is they're just trash cards in here. Um... So, oh, also playing Terraforming. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, 
Uh, if you were on Breakers, by the way, because I feel like it's easier to play the, the Bestial Engine with Breakers. Um, it's easier to have more space. Um, you could you could take a different route here. But anyhow, I think this looks fine. Um, I, when I'm, when I am forced to choose between one of the, um, one of the Auxilla's, uh, and two Legatia's or one Legatia and two Auxilla, I'm always torn because Auxilla is like so much better when you're going first. And sometimes if you're playing a grind, you do want the second Auxilla to search something else. But then also, you know, you might make both Auxilla and Legatia going first. And then when you're grinding, Getting the draw pop is better off with Legatia. So yeah, if you're pressed, if you only have three spaces for these, I don't really know which one you, you would pick. Um, I do like both Double Blazar and also the Red Supernova. I really like this card. Um, oops. Uh, so Chengying. Hmm. Is there a reliable way that you're triggering the Chengying besides with a Bestial? I guess you could, um, hold on a second. Let me check the wording here. Um, if a card is banished, okay. Hmm. I, I, I'm not sure what I think about the Cheng Ying. I guess, I guess there are ways to trigger it. Um, yeah, the spider. Yeah, the spider. I feel like if you're on this many bestials, you have to play it. Chaos Angel, you have to play it, um, especially because you can make it um, out of turn. Uh, pack bit. I feel like um, when it's easier to make tens, I feel like Vorp Gate is generally better, but Pack Bit has more synergy with the Century on deck, so I'm fine with that. Baguska. Um, so I, I actually find it kind of hard to go into uh, cards like these. They're often like these uh, weird locks that you get put into, where um, Maybe you didn't get to continue your combo after you use this card, and then you can out special summon from the extra deck except Centurion monsters uh, while you control that card or any card with the same original name. Um, so sometimes I feel like you just can't make the Baguska. Uh, I also feel like the I feel like the Little Knight is always solid in almost every single deck. The Mascarena, I don't know how often this would come up or if you have like a particular play. I mean, maybe if you were like going second and you used a couple of Bestials and you wanted to link off or something, but then wouldn't you mostly be using these as Synchro Material to just like Dispatter or Chaos Angel? I don't know. I, I'm, I don't know if I'm sold on this, but I think that this actually looks pretty good. Um, I like Deck Lockdown for when you're going first. Um, I think that you could main one Prosperity. There, I, don't, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't main it just because it's at one. Uh, it's, it's probably better than almost any other card in here. So I would probably replace one bonfire with a prosperity, but otherwise I think this looks pretty good to me. Okay. Um, so this one is based on the tribute summon, uh, deck profile that I made recently. Um, so I discovered, so, so someone said in one of the comments or no, in discord, uh, was it, what was it called? So this card actually searches Sphere mode. When this card is activated, add a winged dragon of rat or one card that mentions it from your deck to your hand, except uh, the true sun god. And then forget about the rest of it. Uh, so this searches sphere mode, but also if you're playing the white forest stuff, it stays on field. So it's a plus one that uh, remains useful. It's not just dead on your field. Now, this is obviously not a white forest deck. This is like a straight up pure Azamina Fiendsmith deck. Um, I think like the the one the one th the issue about just Fiendsmith and just Azamina is that it feels like the those engines do very linear things and you don't have a lot of flexibility that the other engine would give you. So most of the decks that would be using the Azamina or Azamina and Fiends with stuff like Snake Eyes or like Fire King Azamina um, or the White Forest stuff, they have more flexibility in what they can do. And so um, even though these cards are broken, I feel like they might struggle against... Uh, I don't know, maybe like in, in the grind or something, but yeah. The other thing about Sphere Mode, which is like kind of weird, is that if you don't need your normal summon and you can reliably tribute three monsters, this is one of the most broken cards in the game. Um, Lava Golem is obviously more reliable and it's a, it's a one for two. So, you know, it's like a good trade. Um, but if you were sure that the Sphere Mode would would go off every single time, then like you'd basically just have to main this card or you just have to play this card as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is cheesy, so I don't know. I, I would not take this to like a major event because I feel like it's too, it's too cheesy, but yeah. Um, okay. This is going to be a long video, but I'm going to try to finish real quick. 
So, okay, um, we have White Forest, Azamina with a single engraver in the main, and I think most of these ratios look pretty standard aside from the cross out and called by. These are like OCG ratios where um, a quarter of your deck is just not losing to full loss or maxi, so... Um, I think if you're expecting to play against a bunch of hand traps and the ones that are in your deck or maybe even other Azamina cards, I think this is, this is acceptable. Um, would be nice to have, uh, slightly more witches in here, but if you are playing the cross out on the call by, you don't really have as much space. So, um, I think this is fine. Although I prefer if there were a little bit more hand traps, I think I would probably prefer like, uh, more nibs and maybe ogres over these four cards, but, um, otherwise I think this is fine, the extra deck is fine, I'm never really sold on Mascarena in, uh, in these types of decks, but, um, I think pr I would probably rather play Rabbit inside one of the, the targets, or main one of the targets, um, okay, here we have, uh, White Forest Centurion, um, so, when I've been testing this, one of the things that I don't like is that if you draw the Primera or the Trudea, even though it doesn't brick you, it, it makes your combo extremely awkward and you're kind of forced to normal summon it. Um, and you don't want to. You want to normal summon your White Forest cards. So the best way that I've found to minimize this is to reduce the number of normal summons of the White Forest cards and really rely on like Elzette and Rusia um, so that the chance of you drawing double normals with these two different engines rarely, really comes up. Um, but ultimately, there's no way to stop that conflict, and I think that's the main problem with combining these engines. Um, this particular deck is very, very light on actual non-engine that, like, does stuff, because there's, like, Ash, Imperm, and then the cross-out targets Nib and Valor, which is not a lot of cards. Um, the Fuelos, like, is also then therefore less likely to draw you into your hand traps. I think if you were on breakers, but then you probably wouldn't want to play these cards as much, then the full loss would be uh, probably more value. So I think that uh, the engine, given the constraints of the engine, is fine, but I think that the non-engine combination is, is not optimal. Um, yeah. Uh, so wait, I just lost track of where I was. So I was on this one. Okay, so now I'm here. Um, so he says this is a budget version. Um, he's maining Scourge and he's maining Droplets. So let's see. Droplets does work with the Imperm and the Nib, but not the Ash and the uh, Valor. Um, it can work with Talents in awkward scenarios. Mm, I think this is borderline not acceptable to play Droplet, but it's also... You, you know, you... Hmm, I, think, I think it's okay, but it's not like optimized for if you draw a Droplet. Otherwise, I think this is like a pretty standard looking list, but I would definitely not play both Reframing and Azirune. I think if you're maining one of the rabbit targets, that should be the only card that is a brick going second that you accept in your deck. Skill Drain is a little bit different because the card is so broken that um, it can still be useful even going second. Um, so I think overall this looks fine aside from mainly that, and I personally do not like the, the droplets here, but you know... Um, and then here we have uh, another White Forest Centurion, but this time it's on Breakers and Bestials. So I think that um, Breakers makes a lot of sense for these types of decks where you're combining a bunch of engines and you don't have a lot of space for the non-engine. Um, so I, I like that. Also, if you have like monsters that clear stuff like the Satellite Warrior and uh, Vorpgate and whatever, the Dark Ruler, you actually do get value off of it. It's not just dead. Um, now, Power Sink Stone someone else or one or two other people were playing. Um, this is kind of interesting, especially with the Centurion cards. So each time a monster effect is activated, this is a continuous trap, place a Spellstone counter on this card, maximum two. While this card has two Spellstone counters, neither player can activate the effects of face-up monsters on the field. Also, the effects of face-up monsters on the field are negated. So this is actually not the same as Skill Drain. And then during the end phase, if this card has any Spellstone counters, you remove them. Now, the cool thing about this, right, is... Let's say you go first, and um, you make your board, okay, you pass turn, and your opponent goes to play, and um, you, wait, where was this? Uh, so, you ha let's say that you have your Centurion combo set up, let's say that you have, you know, for example, like Trudea, Primera, and in, in the trap zone, you activate their effects to bring them out, those are trap effects, by the way, so the, the counters haven't been placed on them yet, and then, you know, maybe you use the, um, maybe you go like, Primera effect and stand up effect. So that's uh, that's one counter on the power sink stone. And if you have used no other effects that turn, your opponent will have one effect left before power sink stone is in effect. And um, 
The, the only thing about this is th that I don't like is that neither player can activate the effects of face-up monsters on the field. And then also the, the face-up monsters on the field are negated. Now, if this were skill drain, you could still do something like you could summon out like an Arciella and uh, for cost, send the skill drain to search like a Valor or whatever. And that would actually resolve because the, the skill drain wouldn't be on field at the time of resolution because it would have been paid as cost. But with Power Sync Stone, you can't even attempt to activate it. So I think there's like more chance of something going wrong. But I also do think that this has like, it does have a lot of synergy with uh, the White Forest and the Centurion cards. So, um, but, I, but I do, the only thing though is I feel like if you were playing this card, like wouldn't you just play three of it? Because this is, this is basically a win condition, right? Like if you, if you're able to actually set up your board, it's not like you have a problem with your siding pattern. I don't want to cover this in this video because this will be way too long. But like, Let's say that you were siding and you were going first. You're not keeping an evenly matched. Even if you're keeping a dark rule, there's no reason you're keeping an evenly matched, right? So like you could take out three evenly matched, you put in three power sync. Take out three evenly matched, take out one dark ruler, three power sync, one skill drain, easy. Um, and then you still have space for the for the D barriers. You take out the rest of the dark rulers. You could take out um, the bestials depending on the matchup or or at least, you know, one of the, the Druus worms. Um, take out one of the tails. You don't even need to main two of those. Uh, so yeah, I feel like if you are going to play the Power Sync, you should just commit and play three of those. I always love to see Gallant, Gallant Granite. I think this is super underrated, and searching for Nib in a deck that also searches for Valor is crazy strong, and people really underestimate that because your deck grinds. Um, so I think this is I think this is good. I like this. I like your commit, committing to the Breakers makes sense. Um, I like... There is a Chaos Angel, right? I like that you can, you can go like... Um, Primera and uh, Druus Worm into Chaos Angel out of turn and make a light and dark Chaos Angel and then you can chain block however you want if you need to with Druus Worm and Chaos Angel. Um, yeah, I, I, I like this deck. Um, yeah, I, I just, but you should play the three, the three Power Sync Stone and uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, that is it for today. Guys, thanks for watching this extremely long video. If you enjoyed, then subscribe. If you want shorter videos, let me know. Thanks for watching.